All right, we're going to get started because um, I've been informed this is it. So why don't we just kind of go around the room and uh, introduce ourselves. So why don't we start over here. Chris Miley, uh, Supervisor of Dubai's office. Tanya Washington, intern, Supervisor Miley's office. And Bob Swanson, Supervisor Miley's office. So, uh, so, Michael, I wanted to try to set this up. I know Bob's been uh, communicating not just with you, but a lot of people all over the country and all over the world around this whole issue of uh, e-cigarettes. Uh, and this matter is coming to support supervisors tomorrow in terms of the form of legislation. Now, my, and the public health people also know this. My position is I have no problem with regulating e cigarettes. I just don't want to regulate it as a tobacco product. And I know you've, you have some opinions around all of this. And I was hoping that if we had this, uh, this discussion, it might be informative for both uh, my office and I was hoping we'd have some other supervisors' offices here, but they aren't, uh, and also our public health people. So that's kind of the, the nature of, of this, this discussion at this point in time. And if you want to just take some time and, and credential yourself before getting into your your um, your remarks, that'd be fine too. Sure. Well, first of all, thank you so much, Supervisor Miley, for the opportunity to, to talk to you um, about this really, you know, very controversial and I think very fascinating issue. Um, just as a little bit of background, I'm a professor. Um, in the Community Health Sciences Department at the Boston University School of Public Health. Uh, and for about the last 25 years or so, I've been involved in doing research in the tobacco control area. Um, but I feel very close to home because uh, 20, believe it or not, 22 years ago, um, I spent a couple of years out in uh, California. Uh, I was at UC Berkeley uh, at the time doing a preventive medicine residency and uh, was involved, had the great fortune to be able to work with the Alameda County uh, Health Department along with the uh, American Lung Association, the American Heart Association, uh, working on basically promoting smoke-free restaurant laws throughout the, the Bay Area. And this was in 1992 and 1993, which was really when these smoke free uh, laws really began to spread uh, throughout California. Um, and so I had the, the great pleasure of working with people like Serena Chen, uh, the Lung Association, um, with Diane Kaiser, Kleinschmidt from the Heart Association, um, with uh, the folks at Americans for Non Smokers' Rights, at the time Julia Carroll and Mark Kirchuk, and with uh, with some of the faculty there, including Stan Glantz, who was actually my mentor uh, in, in tobacco control. Um, so I have very, very, very close feelings uh, to, uh, to the Bay Area, but specifically to Alameda County. Um, and I actually did a, an internship with the Al Alameda County Health Department uh, for a year. Um, and produced a document at that time, which was widely circulated, um, and it was basically a, a review of the effects of secondhand smoke in the workplace, uh, focusing on restaurants and bars and the exposure of bar workers, and, and that played a large role in uh, getting a lot of the communities in the Bay Area to go school free. Um, and it was really a pleasure at that time working with uh, then Councilman Miley uh, who really championed the, the Oakland smoke-free uh, restaurant law, uh, which turned out to be a, you know, not only an important accomplishment for Oakland, um, but it really paved the way for uh, a proliferation of smoke-free laws that basically just took off from there. And uh, only one year after that, just as I was leaving California, uh, the state passed its 100% smoke-free restaurant law. Uh, so it was a good way to wrap up my, my time in, in California. Uh, so that's my history. Uh, I've worked, I'd say that the main thing I've been involved in throughout my career has been uh, the smoke free air movement, um, trying to clear the air in, in workplaces, bars, and restaurants. Um, 
and uh, doing research on the effects of, of various uh, tobacco control policies. So I thought I would start by just sharing with you my reaction when I first heard about electronic cigarettes, and then trying to share some of the information that has uh, become available since that time that has really changed my, my opinions uh, significantly. So when I first heard about electronic cigarettes, which was back in 19, uh, sorry, uh, 2009, um, my first assumption that this was just another ploy of the tobacco industry, uh, that they were just trying to, that they come up with this clever idea of creating just yet another uh, product that they would claim is safer than cigarettes, but which really is not. Uh, there's a long history of tobacco industry efforts uh, to come up with these products that make it look like they're a lot safer, uh, but really they're not, and they end up just hooking more kids uh, on, uh, on their products uh, without adding any benefit. Uh, and so that was my first impression. Uh, and I was kind of disgusted and, and thought, you know, we've got to do something to get these things off the market. Over the course of the, of the two years or so from that time forward, uh, I started studying the products, researching the products, talking to people using these products. And to my surprise, I discovered that it's very, very different than I initially thought. And I think that there are a lot of folks in the tobacco control movement who are basically where I was in 2009 when these products first came on the market. Uh, and I totally understand it because I was in that, I was in that exact same position. Um, but I think that the research that has come out since then, and also my experience talking to vapors, people using these products, has really changed my, my view. Um, so there's a couple of important scientific facts that I just wanted to make it put on the table um, as background. And then uh, I'll get a little more specific and share some of the concerns that I have about the specific legislation. Um, but what changed my mind? Well, the first thing is, to my surprise, I found out that the tobacco companies actually had nothing to do with electronic cigarettes. Uh, so in 2009, when these products uh, started to spread in the market uh, in the US, the tobacco industry had nothing to do with it. it this was all of the companies were independent of, of the tobacco companies. It really wasn't until 2012 that the uh, tobacco companies uh, got involved in electronic cigarettes. And of course, the overwhelming number of brands of electronic cigarettes on the market, there's estimated to be about 450 to 500 different brands on the market, only two of those, and only three of those brands are actually produced by big tobacco. So the overwhelming majority of the electronic cigarettes that are on the market uh, are really completely independent of, of big tobacco. The second thing that really changed my mind was seeing the research um, demonstrating that these products really were much safer than tobacco cigarettes. Um, there is a tremendous amount of literature out there, although we often hear people say, well, we don't know anything about electronic cigarettes. We really have no idea how safe they are. There actually is quite a bit of research that's been done over the last three years uh, with these products, and we really do have a pretty good sense of their safety profile. Uh, obviously, we don't know uh, the long-term effects of using these products for, say, 20 or 30 years. Um, but we do have a pretty good idea that they don't have a very dangerous profile in terms of their acute effects. In fact, smokers, uh, there have been very uh, definitive studies showing that smokers who switch to electronic cigarettes experience an immediate improvement in their health, both objectively and subjectively. Uh, they report improvement in their respiratory symptoms immediately and objective uh, evidence of respiratory improvement in terms of uh, improved spirometry measurements uh, that occur uh, within weeks of switching to electronic cigarettes. Um, there's also a large number of studies showing that the, the number of toxins and the levels of the toxins and carcinogens that are present in e-cigarettes are uh, greatly reduced 
um, and the the cytotoxicity profile and the toxicological profile of electronic cigarettes is really not all that different from products like the nicotine uh, patch or nicotine gum. Um, so if you look at car if you measure carcinogen levels in nicotine uh, in the nicotine gum or nicotine uh, inhalers or patches, it's basically very similar to what you see with electronic cigarettes. So we know that we're dealing with a product that is orders of magnitude safer than than, than smoking. Um, and, and just to make it very clear, and I think this is a really important point, this is not a tobacco product. And what I mean by that is there is no tobacco in the product. It is not derived from tobacco. It has nothing to do with tobacco. Um, the only reason why it's been called a tobacco product is from a purely legislative perspective um, in terms of the Food and Drug Administration. Um, and, and that is because in the regulation uh, of tobacco products uh, under the uh, federal law, the um, definition of tobacco product is any product that is made from uh, tobacco or any constituent of tobacco, including nicotine. So the fact that electronic cigarettes uh, contain nicotine is really the sole reason why they are considered tobacco products, and that's really only under a legal definition. Um, I think that the most important thing to realize, and that I think the public needs to know, is that these are not tobacco products. There's no tobacco in them. Um, and in fact, that's why they're so much safer. Uh, if there was tobacco in the products, uh, then this would be just another scam. Um, in fact, the tobacco industry has come up with uh, scams in the past in which they've done something similar to electronic cigarettes in, in that they've heated their tobacco instead of combusting the tobacco. Um, had a product named, uh, RJR had a product called Eclipse, Philip Morris had a product called Accord. These were tobacco products that heated the tobacco rather than um, combusted it, burning it. And lo and behold, research showed that in fact, the carbon monoxide levels that these delivered to, to smokers was even higher uh, than regular cigarettes. So those were truly scams. This is not a scam because there's no tobacco in there and there's and there's no combustion. Um, and I think that's a point that's really been been, been lost among uh, a lot of the misinformation that's out there. There's also a concern, uh, which I should honestly share at the beginning, uh, that this is somehow going to be a gateway to smoking, that people are going to start out with electronic cigarettes as a starter product, and that they're going to then progress to cigarette smoking. And if that was if that was the case, uh, this would be a disaster. I mean, I would be the first one, basically doing everything I could do to uh, to get e-cigarettes off the market, if that was the case. Um, but fortunately, the evidence right now. Uh, I think pretty convincingly shows that that's simply not the case. Uh, in fact, I think it's the opposite. I think that electronic cigarettes are actually, the main function they're serving among youth is keeping kids away from the real thing. Uh, if you talk to kids and ask them what it is that they like about electronic cigarettes, they like the fact, they like the flavorings. Um, they like the fact that it's cool, um, they can blow these vapor rings, and basically, they're losing their taste in smoking. As the rates of electronic cigarette use among youth have proliferated, uh, and we're talking huge increases, a quadrupling of, of use of electronic cigarettes over the last four years, uh, the rates of smoking among these same youth have plummeted to, in fact, historically low levels. Um, now, to make it clear, very clear, I'm not advocating electronic cigarettes among youth. I'm certainly not arguing that we should promote electronic cigarettes among youth. In fact, I think quite the opposite. I think we should ban the sale of the product to minors. I think we should ban the marketing of the product uh, to minors. And I've been calling for FDA to, uh, to do just that. Uh, however, I think it is important to recognize that these products do not appear to be a gateway to tobacco use. If anything, they appear to be leading kids away from tobacco use, and I think one of the one of the reasons for that 
is because it's really hard for kids to initiate tobacco use. The tobacco industry had to go to great extremes to make that happen. And the way they did that successfully was by putting an anesthetic into their cigarettes. And it was only by putting that anesthetic in to anesthetize the respiratory tracts of these kids that they were able to get these kids to tolerate the harsh smoke. And uh, of course, the name of that anesthetic is menthol. Uh, and that's why 50% of kids who smoke smoke menthol cigarettes and about 80% of African-American youth who smoke, smoke menthol cigarettes. And it's, it's not that menthol has such a great taste, it's that menthol actually anesthetizes uh, the respiratory tract so that the smoke becomes more tolerable. And so in effect, electronic cigarettes are kind of a negative, uh, it's almost like a uh, immunization against smoking. Because once these kids get used to, to inhaling the cherry and the flavors, the various flavors, the sweet candy flavorings of electronic cigarettes, the chances that they're gonna then pick up a Marlboro are really remote. I mean, it's hard enough to just smoke a Marlboro when you're going from initiating for the first time. But for somebody who's used to, to, to using these cherry and, and uh, banana flavors, um, you're not gonna just pick up a Marlboro and, and enjoy it. So it, this argument that somehow these, these things are a, a starter product or they're leading kids to, to, to tobacco use is, is just not, it's certainly not worn out by the evidence. Um, and again, that doesn't mean we should promote electronic cigarette use, but I do think it's important to have an accurate picture of what the risks and benefits of these of these products are. Um, now, just a couple things in terms of the specific legislation, uh, some concerns that I have that I just wanted to share, uh, and then I really just want to make myself available for, for questions that you may have or comments about 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 this. Um, but I, there's two major issues in the legislation. First, let me say that um, I have no problem with the idea and support the idea that electronic cigarette retailers should be regulated. I think it's perfectly reasonable and appropriate that they, re be, they be required to obtain tobacco licenses. Uh, I think it's perfectly reasonable to um, and appropriate that they not be allowed to give out free electron electronic cigarette samples, that electronic cigarettes not be sold in vending machines. Um, so I basically think that the, the ultimate goal of the legislation, the proposed legislation, is, is, uh, is a good one. And I think that a lot of what it aims to accomplish um, is, is uh, very appropriate. But there are still two concerns that I have. The first one, and I think this is just an overriding concern, is the way that these products are defined in the legislation and treated in the legislation. And that is that the ordinance, both ordinances, uh, really define electronic cigarettes as tobacco products. Mm -hmm. um, the definition of tobacco product includes electronic cigarettes. and. I think it's problematic because it, I think it's very misleading. Um, electronic cigarettes are not tobacco products. There's no tobacco in them. And I think it's confusing to, to call them tobacco products. I think it actually undermines, the, my concern is that it really undermines the public's appreciation of the severe hazards of smoking. Um, if you look at data, public opinion data, from the last three years, the public's appreciation of how hazardous smoking is has actually gone down. Uh, after decades of public education, they got the public to really understand just how severe smoking is. Uh, and that led to the lowest rates we've ever seen of smoking. Um, it's starting to deteriorate. And the reason I think it's deteriorating is because the public is starting to hear that smoking isn't that bad anymore. And specifically what they're hearing is that smoking is only as bad as vaping. Uh, and the public isn't stupid. Uh, they know that vaping isn't that bad because there are millions of vapors out there and we've seen no zero health effects from this. Um, I'm not talking about uh, uh, the, the poisonings to children or the exploding batteries, which are problems, but in terms of the acute health effects of actually vaping, we really haven't seen any, any uh, adverse effects. 
um, at least in the, in the acutely. So I think it's a problem for the public to get the perception that these are just another form of tobacco. E-cigarettes is just another form of tobacco. And um, it's, it's, it's just another way of smoking. Because it really isn't. It's totally different. It's a game changer. Um, it is literally saving a lot of thousands of people. I can't tell you how many patients and how many uh, individuals uh, have written me uh, telling me how electric, how, how electronic cigarettes have saved, literally saved their lives. Uh, they failed to quit smoking using traditional uh, approaches, uh, and electronic cigarettes were the only thing that got, that got them to quit smoking. Um, and I, to be honest, I've gotten more testimonials from people about quitting using e-cigarettes than I have um, from any other type of nicotine product. I mean, I don't get letters from people using the nicotine patch uh, saying, thank you for your advocacy of the nicotine patch. It's mm -hmm. saving my life. Um, but every day I get five, six, seven letters from vapors writing me saying, you know, thank you for your support of electronic cigarettes. These products have saved my life. Um, so I, I really do think that it's important uh, that the Board of Supervisors clear, make it clear to the public that these are not cigarettes, that they're, they contain no tobacco, they're not tobacco products, and therefore they're going to be defined differently. Um, I think that electronic cigarettes should simply be defined as electronic cigarettes. They have nothing to do with tobacco. They are electronic cigarettes, just as the ordinance defines them. Uh, but then later on in the ordinance, when it defines tobacco products, it says, "Oh, tobacco products include e-cigarettes." And I don't. I think that should that should be a distinction. There shouldn't be tobacco products, which include cigarettes, smokeless tobacco, hookah, whatever else you want to put in there, um, which actually is tobacco. And then there should be electronic cigarettes, which don't contain tobacco. And I think it's perfectly fine to then state uh, we are going to apply to tobacco products and to electronic cigarettes the following restrictions. Uh, or alternatively, you know, we're going to add electronic cigarettes to the list of products that must comply with the following regulations. Uh, and that would be the licensing, or the yeah, the licensing restrictions, the vending machines restrictions, the um, uh, free sample restrictions. So I, I think that you know it may sound like a minor, minor technicality in terms of the definitions, but in, but I, in this case I really don't view it that way. I think it's a major statement um, by a government organization, by the government health agencies. Um, about how you compare smoking with the risks of other alternative products which are much safer. And putting it in the same category um, is problematic. Um, the second, I guess the only, really the only other issue that I wanted to raise um, is the question of the ban on vaping in all of the public places. Mm -hmm. Um, that are listed in the ordinance. Um, you know, I testified before the Oakland City Council in 1993. Uh, a lot of the opponents of the smoking ban at that time came up to me and they said, you know, Dr. Siegel, you're, you're, you're a phony because you just want to get rid of smoking because you don't like it. And even if you didn't have all the uh, evidence, the scientific evidence on the health effects of smoking in restaurants and bars, you would still want to ban it because you just don't want, you just don't like the, the smell of it. You want to get rid of it. And I tried to convince them that, you know, no, that's not the case. I'm here because I have evidence that I've actually put together as uh, my thesis as a UC Berkeley public health student, which documents the severe hazards of secondhand smoke for restaurant uh, and bar bar workers. And my fear today is that, the, is that we really don't have solid evidence that secondhand exposure to vaping actually causes any health effects. Um, and so it's a little bit troublesome to me to think about, you know, how would I respond to those 
those same opponents who said, you're just doing this without evidence, just on speculation. Um, and so it's a, it's a little bit harder for me to, to defend, especially when the ordinance includes outdoor places uh, within 20 feet outdoors of certain places where I can't see any way in which vaping is going to be a problem. And also, the ordinance excludes, specifically excludes, uh, multi-unit housing. I mean, I think if, if, if the county really wants to do something to protect the public health of its residents, the most pressing issue by far is the fact that you have people living in multi-unit housing who don't have the same protection that all of the rest of us do who live in homes, uh, single family homes or separate homes uh, from secondhand smoke. And the, uh, you know, to me, that's a priority before worrying about whether someone might uh, have a severe health effect from somebody vaping standing 20 feet away from a door. It seems to me that we would first want to make sure that people living in their homes, uh, just living their normal lives, aren't exposed to the uh, you know, 60 or more carcinogens in, in tobacco smoke and the more than 10,000 chemicals that we know are deadly, for which there's very strong evidence that, that they're deadly. So uh, basically, in conclusion, that you know, my, my two main points are, number one, that the way that tobacco products, or the way that electronic cigarettes are defined in the ordinance, I think is important. Um, and I think that separating them out, making it clear that they're not tobacco products, understanding and recognizing that their risks are much lower than tobacco products. We're talking about a not just a quantitative difference, but really a qualitative difference. I think that that distinction needs to be needs to be made in the legislation. Um, and secondly, uh, I think just more thought needs to be put into what are the priorities in terms of uh, protecting uh, the public from exposure to nicotine-containing products, and really where, where are the priorities and what's the most important thing. It's not clear to me that uh, banning vaping every single place where, where smoking is disallowed, especially outdoors, in outdoor spaces, um, is necessarily rising, it necessarily rises to the top of the agenda. Um, and also, it's a little problematic to me uh, that this is being done without any clear evidence that um, secondhand vaping is, is causing uh, health effects. We, as I said, when we testified for the smoke-free restaurants, we had very strong, convincing evidence um, that exposure to secondhand smoke in bars and restaurants and workplaces was extremely high, and that people were actually suffering. Uh, we were able to actually bring in people from these places who were suffering health effects. Um, and so I think it was a little bit of a different story. So uh, again, thank you so much, Supervisor Riley, for the time. Appreciate the opportunity to share my perspectives. and. Um, Really, we welcome any questions or even comments that people have. Uh, anything that I can do to help, I really would be happy to do. Well, thank you. I think this has been very helpful. Uh, I think it's about, it's been about maybe 30 plus minutes. We won't have this much time tomorrow, I don't think, to present to the board. So I'm trying to push to get you at least 15 minutes, 10, 50 minutes. So if we could try to put together the presentation to the board in 10, 15 minutes. And the other thing is, is this being recorded, Bob? I've, I've got my cameras here and hopefully the... Okay, because the other thing is, I, Tanya here's from my office. Maybe I'll have Bob and Tanya work with you so we can put together um, something written that we can present to the board as well uh, tomorrow. So they have the, uh, the, the full effect of what you've given to us this uh, afternoon. Because I think it's been really good. Because I don't think, and I, other than Supervisor Chan, um, and her office, I don't think has been as engaged in this as I have. Because most of the regulations that will affect the county are in my district, the unincorporated community. Um, and and there is a, clearly a, a dispute around whether or not we need this type of a, a regulation based on it being defined as a tobacco product. I think people. I think there's universal support for the regulation itself, but not being defined as a tobacco product. So 
So I think for the Board of Supervisors to understand the nuances of this, I think it's, for me it's going to be important so that the Board makes a decision that I think is contrary to what I think is uh, the best decision, at least they'll be informed of that based on um, your expertise. Because they've been hearing from our public health staff, they're here today, and I want to give them a chance to ask you questions. I don't know if anything you've said has stimulated any um, um, uh, thoughts in their minds that might reverse some of their positions, but they've been pretty, pretty stuck on their position. But I've been pretty stuck on the position that I think we need to regulate this as a non-tobacco product, but regulate it as a non-tobacco product. And for the love of me, I can't understand why people don't get that. So I uh, just wanted to kind of frame it and then make sure we do that follow-up for tomorrow, too, so that we can get this information clearly to the board, because he won't have as much time to present it before supervisors meeting. So I'll, I'll open it up to questions and comments. Um, <clears throat> Healthcare England came, came out with uh, press releases uh, uh, back in August and September regarding e-cigarettes and now they consider them to be part of their smoking cessation and that they found them to be 95% safer. How does that strike you? Well, I think that the Public Health England report was, I think it was a very important report because essentially it's the first health agency report that has ever come out, um, that has come to the conclusion that electronic cigarettes are safer than, than cigarettes, <clears throat> which is really astounding to me because to me this is a, a no-brainer. I mean, as, as someone who's spent my, my career in toxicology and has dealt with all kinds of environmental pollution and environmental substances, um, the idea that, that you know, using inhaling a, uh, a product that contains some propylene glycol uh, and some nicotine that is heated could possibly be uh, as bad as um, smoking combusted tobacco, which produces more than 10,000 chemicals, including more than 60 known carcinogens, to me is a no-brainer. I mean, just from a toxicological standpoint, um, it, it's pretty definitive. So the fact that Public Health England was the first to come out with that report was really was really important. Um, however, I don't believe that the quantification. I don't think I would have gone so far as to as to put a percentage on it, um, because I think it's it's too early to really do that. Um, I mean, my guess is that 95% is just a a, a, a drastic underestimate. Um, I think that the, because that's still, I mean, 95% is still thousands of deaths a year. And we don't, we don't know that electronic cigarettes even cause any chronic disease. Uh, there's no evidence right now. And I'm not saying that, you know, it won't, it won't come, that evidence won't come with long-term studies. Um, but, you know, the acute studies that have been done really don't suggest that there's any major uh, cardiovascular or pulmonary effects and the carcinogenic risk uh, based on what's in there is likely to be extremely low. Um, so I, I don't know that the 95% figure is something that, that you know we should really quantify it at this point. But I think that the ultimate conclusion they came to that these products are much safer than cigarettes is, is, is a vital one. And unfortunately, that's the only government agency I know of that has uh, that has actually officially drawn that conclusion. Formaldehyde. Uh, there was a study uh, done in Oregon, and it hit the newspapers. You know, formaldehyde in e-cigarettes all over the country. And then I read that the uh, the people who did the study came out and said, no, no, that wasn't exactly right. Is that they had apparently souped up the vaporizer to get it to create some sort of pre-formaldehyde something, but it, I've heard it quoted all over the place now. Have, are you familiar with that study? Yeah. No. So the, I mean, when this study came out, it was really a scare because the researchers found that what they purported to be high levels of formaldehyde in a number of brands of electronic cigarettes. Um, 
But when we took a closer look at the study, it turns out that the conditions that they were using uh, with the electronic cigarette, uh, they were basically overheating the liquid uh, to extremely high temperatures that were uh, actually conditions that no were intolerable. In other words, no vapor actually using the product could possibly uh, expose themselves to that level because it was it was um, uh, what's called a dry puff condition in which the taste, it's like a charred taste, and no vapor would continue vaping that. Um, so if you look at the same study, and if you look at the results that they found under realistic conditions, they actually failed to find any formaldehyde or, or uh, detectable levels of formaldehyde. Um, so you know, on one hand, the study got a lot of publicity saying that there's, there's huge levels of formaldehyde in, in uh, e-cigarette vapor, and in fact, the study concluded that vaping was five to 15 times more hazardous than smoking. Hmm. Um, but what the study really found is that under normal vaping con conditions, uh, the formaldehyde exposure is extremely low. Um, now, I'm actually uh, working with the FDA. I've testified uh, before the FDA commented to the FDA uh, that there need to be regulations on the temperature of these devices. And I've actually, in comments that I submitted to the uh, OMB as well as FDA, I've argued that there should be voltage limits on these products mm -hmm. so that you can't get to the type of conditions where it gets hot enough to produce formaldehyde. Um, so hopefully the federal government will take some steps on a, uh, to make these products uniform so that uh, all of the products uh, are similar in terms of the exposure profile. We know that the major brands, uh, like Enjoy, uh, uh, ironically, the, the brands that the tobaccos into, uh, produce, tobacco companies produce, like Blue, uh, in, uh, Views, and Mark, Mark uh, 10, have all been tested for products like formaldehyde and have not, none of those, none of those products have been uh, has there been detectable levels of formaldehyde? Um, so there is something in the manufacturing process that it's done right, and I think it has to do with the heat uh, overheating protection, overcharge protection. Um, so the technology exists to get rid of that problem completely, um, and hopefully the FDA will, you know, will put the regulations in place so that that that's not going to be a problem. Yeah. Um. Can, do you know if we, and I don't have county council, and I should, should probably have them here, can our local ordinance try to uh, prescribe some type of mechanism around um, knowing what is um, what what type of um, flavors being used in the e-cigarette? Let's say uh, uh, how it's being heated, how it's, you know you know, just the components so that we can regulate that some kind of way. Recently, you know, we passed, I led the charge to pass an ordinance in 2012 here in Alameda County that requires the pharmaceutical industry, if they have uh, uh, medicines here in Alameda County, that they've got to come up with a plan to dispose of them. You know, we were sued, but we won. It's like, you know, back in the day when I pushed the stuff around, smoke free, and that was cutting edge at the time. So, so, I'm thinking about with the e-cigarettes, if we get it away from being prescribed as a tobacco product, can we put more restrictions around understanding what's being sold to consumers in our jurisdiction here in Allen County? Well, that, I mean, that's really, it's, it's a very insightful point, actually, because one of the, the downsides of classifying electronic cigarettes as a tobacco product and treating them as a tobacco product is that we don't regulate the safety of tobacco products. It's the one product that basically gets a free ride, right? I mean, there are no safety requirements for cigarettes, zero. They don't have to do a single thing. Cigarettes do not have to do a single thing to in any way uh, make themselves safer. There's no, no uh, uh, levels, that, uh, you know, maximum levels of different chemicals that they can have. There's no specification of manufacturing processes that they can or can't use. There's no specification of uh, 
any flavorings or additives that they can't use, with the exception of um, the candy flavorings, which none of them were really using anyway, um, and menthol's not included, so it, it doesn't really do anything. So the ironic thing is that what we really need to do with electronic cigarettes is exactly what you're describing. We need to treat them as a separate category, and unlike cigarettes, for which we basically just say, okay, you know, we know we know that you're you're deadly, so we're not going to try to put restrictions on you. With electronic cigarettes, there are things that we can do to to regulate them and to make sure that they're as safe as they can be. Um, and so, you know, your idea of actually regulating them as electronic cigarettes, as a category, and putting specific requirements on them, I mean, at the very minimum, uh, something like um, just disclosing the ingredients mm -hmm, mm -hmm, would be a, a minimum measure that would be extremely helpful, mm -hmm. because I think just knowing what the flavorings are that are in there mm -hmm. is really important. Mm -hmm. um, and along with that, what I think would be fascinating and I think the, it would be great for the health department to consider this, and I've never seen it done, would be to do a survey of youth to find out what flavorings they're actually using, what brands of electronic cigarettes are they actually using. Because I think knowing that is the key to trying to prevent that they use. For example, um, are kids using the tobacco industry brands? Are they, are they vaping? the Mark 10s and the Fuse uh, e-cigarettes, or are they using much more obscure products um, that have much more tasteful flavorings or sweet flavorings? Um, and it makes a big difference because the big tobacco companies are the ones that are advertising and marketing the products. And if, if it's true that they're using those products, then regulating the, the marketing would have a huge effect. But if they're using these really sweet flavored products that are made by these in smaller independent companies that you get online or that you get in mall kiosks and things like that, then prevention takes on a completely different focus. You're not going to be able to address it with marketing because those companies aren't marketing. Um, so I, you know, I think your, your thought is very insightful and I, I would like to see nothing more than to have e-cigarettes set out as a separate entity and regulated as such not as tobacco products. I've gone into a number of smoke shops that sell both e-cigarettes and they sell the separate vaporizers. And we have Ben Jewell here from our Ready Set Vape, which is in Castor Valley, is a vape store. He sells no tobacco, he is anti-tobacco, mm -hmm. and uh, when I first heard about our vape shop, I heard it from, uh, from our, our school district. So I went in to investigate what this guy was doing, and uh, you know, I went in undercover, and I found out that, geez, everybody, I talked to all these people coming in and out of there, they're all quitting smoking using the vapor device, and they seem to be pre preferring the vapor device where they can select a flavor, a bottle, and, and put it together. And I went into another smoke shop in Dublin, and I went into one in Castor Valley, and they said that the, uh, that the vapor products, the va separate vaporizer and vaporizer products are selling more than the e-cigarette products or the cigalites. Mm -hmm. Have you run across any, anything like that? Well, yeah, absolutely. The, the, um, I keep in contact with Barney Her Bonnie Herzog from Wells Fargo uh, Securities, and she tracks the sales of, of, of these products. There's no question that what you say, Bob, is correct in that there's been a, a shift from away from the cigalites and towards these um, uh, more advanced vapor, vapor products. And it appears that part of the reason for that is that people like to have control over uh, their choice of flavors. And um, with, this, with the Sigalites, you basically have like one or two choices. I mean, Views, for example, comes in menthol or tobacco flavor. Um, not very exciting. So a lot of uh, vapors are switching to these these uh, products that you get at vape shops, where you, you know, you go into a vape shop, you may have a hundred choices of what flavor. It's like a, a candy store, in a sense. Um, you could choose, you can choose from, from from all of these different flavors. It's also important to note that there is evidence that smoker, or that smokers who use the advanced vaping products are actually more likely to quit, more successful than those who use the, the cigalites. 
And so I, I don't think it's a coincidence that you're seeing when you go to these vape shops and talking to folks, uh, I don't think it's a coincidence that you're talking to people who are much more positive about their experiences and many of whom are telling you, hey, you know, I was able to quit smoking using these products. It's, it's kind of funny because, or ironic because in a sense, vape shops are kind of like a smoking cessation clinic. They're like a smoking cessation clinic in a weird way. Um, there's a lot of social support. People are, are um, talking to each other, supporting each other. Uh, there's a community, um, online community. And um, in a strange way, I think that that's something that adds to the effectiveness of these products for cessation. You don't have that when you slap on a nicotine patch. You know, there's no nicotine patch supporters group. <laughs> you don't get together with other nicotine patch users to talk about the experience. Um, but vapors do. There's a very tight-knit social community, and I think that actually plays a role in the smoking cessation process. It, the, the store that I went into in Dublin, it was a tobacco store, and I was questioning the person behind the counter, and they, they, uh, they told me that they had to put in the vapor products because people were coming in and asking for them, and that they're beginning, the vapor products and the e-cigarettes are beginning to outsell their tobacco. Mm -hmm in that particular store in Dublin. I mean, that's amazing to me. Well, that, Bob, that's why I, you know, I think I used the word game changer. Mm. And that's why I think electronic cigarettes, ultimately, if they're regulated properly, um, meaning differently from cigarettes, uh, specific regulations for e-cigarettes, I think they will at some point become a game changer. Because you're right, they are, people are shifting from combusted tobacco towards these much safer vaping products. And um, a lot of the tobacco analysts have actually predicted that within about a decade, uh, vaping sales are gonna cut 50% into, uh, into uh, combustible cigarette sales. If that happens, it would be a public health uh, miracle, really. I mean, if, you, if we could mm -hmm. cut cigarette consumption in half, uh, by switching a lot of these uh, smokers to vapors, it would be a tremendous public health accomplishment. And um, But I think the key to that happening is taking Supervisor Miley's approach of treating electronic cigarettes as a separate category, distinct from cigarettes, distinct from tobacco products, and regulating them as such. I, I think that is going to be essential in the long run to uh, to essentially make, to get the most out of the public health possibilities that vaping products have brought us. Well, another thing, too, is that... Uh, Bob, let's see if there's anybody else. Oh, okay. Yeah, because we're going to have to wrap up. Anybody else? Is that okay with you, Mike? Yeah. Um, uh, I just had one question. You, um, you mentioned that you didn't have any problem uh, with uh, tobacco licensing. My name's Ben Jewell, and I... Uh, own a, um, a vape store in Castro Valley, uh, but you didn't have any problem with that. But at the same time, in the same breath, you mentioned that there's no tobacco products in this. So why, why require the license? Like, I agree with you in as much as I'd like to fund um, the sheriff's department to come in and shop us and make sure we're not selling to underage people and this sort of thing. But why go the tobacco license route for that? Well, I think that. Well, I mean. I don't know that it would have to be called a tobacco license, mm -hmm. um, but I do think it's reasonable to require a license, um, mainly because it's it's a product that, I mean, we don't want to be sold to minors. Um, we don't want it to, um, we don't want there to be easy access for sure. minors. And so I think it's appropriate to regulate stores that are selling these products to make sure that they're 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 not selling to minors, mm -hmm. you know, that they're taking basic precautions, and so I mean a licensing system is really nothing more than a, a registry essentially, so that at least um, the government will know who are the sellers of these products, where are they located, how many of them are there, um, mm -hmm. and so then they can take measures to uh, you know to make sure that they're operating properly. So I, I don't. You know, I don't view this as a tobacco license, but it's a nicotine product, right. nicotine-containing product, 
So I think it's appropriate. And also, if, if we are going to do something like require um, ingredient disclosures, mm -hmm. um, things like that, I mean, we need to know who, where their products are being sold. So I, I think it's reasonable to basically require companies to or stores to, to essentially register so that we know who they are and where they are. Uh, just a quick follow-up. Yeah. Having it fall under the same rubric as uh, tobacco when we're attempting to delineate uh, the market into you know, uh, tobacco products and non-tobacco products, uh, which would include uh, vaping, um, would it be too, do you, is it your feeling it would be too onerous on uh, government and local government specifically um, to separate uh, it out as a, a vaping license, right? I don't see, I, you know, again, I don't see why not. Mm -hmm. I, I think that it could very easily just, I mean, the language could just be changed sure. to say um, that you have to have a license to sell all five cigarettes. And, you know, you don't have to call that a tobacco license. You can just say it's it's a, a vaping product license. There you go. Um, so, so, no, I mean, in terms of the technicalities of what you call it and how you do it, I think there's room to, to maneuver. Mm -hmm. Well, under the, the general idea of making sure that we're treating electronic cigarettes separately from real cigarettes. Yeah, that's, um, and, and uh, sorry to grandstand, and just my, my last two seconds here, um, I, I really feel like anything that you do that calls vaping a tobacco product, uh, it becomes, uh, there's going to be somebody that says, uh, well, that's just as bad as cigarettes because it's tobacco because it falls under that same heading. And I, I think that's a massive disservice uh, to public health, to, to real public health and not just public health, uh, right? I, you know, I, I, you said it beautifully. I, I totally agree with that. And, and in fact, that is the single most important point that I you know, was trying to get across today, um, mm -hmm. which is that the, the more that we treat electronic cigarettes the same as tobacco products, call them tobacco products, it really clouds the understanding of the public, and in effect, it, it helps to undo decades of progress that we've made in convincing the public of how severe the hazards of smoking are. Mm -hmm. uh, because when they start thinking that, that smoking is only as bad as vaping, that's not a good thing. No. Uh, that, that is really not what we want the public to think. We want them to understand that there is something uniquely dangerous about tobacco. Hmm. So that they understand that if they're using something that contains tobacco, it's going to be a problem. It's going to be hazardous. Um, and so you're right. Another concern I have, uh, Doctor, is that declaring a tobacco product is like a gift to the tobacco industry. I mean, if they declare it a tobacco product, and uh, it, it's going to put out this, the small vape shops, and the small vape shops, like Ready Set Vape in Castor Valley, uh, they're getting people off tobacco, and I don't think the if it turns out to be you can only buy the products that come from tobacco companies, they're not interested in getting you off tobacco or getting you off the vaporizer. Ben Jewell here, when I talk to him, he says, I want to put myself out of business. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's what he wants to do. So. Well, you know, the, that's exactly right. The, the um, you know, in a sense, electronic cigarettes are really the opposite not only are they not tobacco products, but in a sense, they're smoking cessation products. They're anti-smoking products. I mean, these are products that are getting people off cigarettes and off tobacco. So it's kind of strange to call them tobacco products when in reality, they're anti-tobacco products. People are using these primarily to get off tobacco. Now, not everyone is successful, but almost everybody who uses these is at least able to cut down on the amount that they smoke. So, so in a sense, these are anti-tobacco products. So I agree with you. I think that the name tobacco products, putting them under that, that category, um, really does disservice to what these products are doing. And it kind of obscures in the public mind what these products are all about. About 10 years ago is when I quit. Okay, go ahead. So I, I want to thank you for your your generous time you spent with us this um, afternoon. And 
as I said, this will be before the Board of Supervisors tomorrow around 11 o'clock, 2 o'clock your time. And I'm going to try to have my office work with you so we can uh, have the presentation, but also have uh, something written that we can give to the board, that the board and the public will have um, the opportunity to, to, to read. Uh, and, and there might be questions that the board of supervisors might have as a result of your presentation tomorrow as well. I suspect your presentation will follow the staff report uh, on this matter. So even though it's scheduled for 11 o'clock, we'll probably have the staff report first. But I'll check with Supervisor Haggerty as who's the president and see how he wants to um, uh, conduct the meeting. But I think this has been very informative, and I just uh, regret that other supervisors' office, other than Supervisor Bayes' office, wasn't here to hear this. But the public and supervisors will get to hear it tomorrow. Well, so, thank you again for the invitation and the opportunity to share to share my perspective and this information. And uh, you know, of course, I'll, I'll be happy and look forward to uh, to contributing tomorrow. And uh, but in the future, you know, anyone uh, at the meeting there or now or in the future, if there are questions or things you want to talk about or um, even disagreements that you want to hash out, um, feel free to contact me. Uh, email is just mbsegal at bu edu, uh, and uh, I'm happy to try to help out in whatever way I can. Okay. Thanks, and um, I know it's hard to stay warm back there at six <laughs> degrees, but do your best. All right. All right. So thanks, thank you, John. Thank you. Thank Bye. you, Mr. Sheehan. Thank you.